Welcome to the Coming Home Well podcast, the show that educates, supports, and advocates for the veteran community. Your host, Dr. Tyler Piron, U.S. Army retired, will bring you exciting conversations with amazing guests about resources, research, and military history, all geared to helping our warriors to come home well. Here's your host, Dr. Tyler Piron. Welcome back to Coming Home Well. I'm your host, Tyler Piron, and today we're going to be having a conversation about leadership. Now, if you've been in the military, you've heard all about leadership, you've taken courses, you've had that experience, but how does it translate out of the military where somebody doesn't have to follow your orders or somebody doesn't have to do the things you say to do? And how do you apply it to your own life? These are some big challenges, and sometimes people have a challenge adjusting to this entirely unhierarchical system. And and so we actually have an expert come in. Her name is Mary Kelly. She's a PhD, and she also attended the Naval Academy, retired from the Navy. So she's got a lot of experience with leadership, but now she goes and helps people sort of deal with leadership issues. Mary, thanks so much for joining us on Coming Home Well. Tyler, I'm so excited to talk to your folks today because we all know more about leadership than most people around us do. And sometimes that in and itself is a challenge. It sure is. I mean, you might know it and you know how it works in the military, but how in the world do you apply the same leadership that, you know, everyone thinks of from the movies? If you're not familiar, it's totally different in real life. But everyone thinks that, you know, military leadership is just yelling at people and, you know, barking orders. And clearly that isn't the case, but there's a lot of people who think that's how it really is. Many civilians are actually worried about hiring military people because they think that that is what they're going to get. And of course, they're wrong. But because they don't have any other experience, that is what has been given to them by the media, by movies. And this is one of the reasons why sometimes it is hard for military people to break into civilian organizations. I'm so lucky because I get to work with some civilian organizations that are actively promoting veterans. They actively look to hire them. They actively want to promote them. They've got programs to kind of bridge that gap. And I always get asked about the leadership component. You know, how is it different? And how do we as military people you know, sometimes struggle with our own leadership and sometimes struggle with leading the people around us, even when we're hired and we're not necessarily in a leadership position. There's a real challenge. I mean, you have so many people that are betrayed to always take charge. Mm-hmm. And then you're in a different environment where taking charge is sort of frowned upon. My older brother was a Marine helicopter pilot for 25 years. He married a naval officer. My husband was a a force recon Marine. My younger sister was an Air Force comms officer. She married a Navy maintenance officer. My younger brother was a Navy pilot. So we all get together and we talk in short, choppy sentences. And you do not want to be around us if if there's groups of people milling about not very smartly because we get irritated. And this we know this is not a good a good attribute. You know, this is kind of challenging. We're used to being bossy. My poor sister-in-law, who is not in the military, We love her to pieces and she's a kind person. But one time she just goes, y'all are just mean. We're like, we're not mean. We're very straightforward and very direct. She said, it kind of comes across as mean. I thought, well, I'll take that. That's probably true. Sometimes our directness is not appreciated. But sometimes where we are assessing a situation is also not where the people around us are. And sometimes we're so used to taking charge that we can be sometimes perceived of as, as being, you know, a little bossy. And I'll I'll take that. But I also know that when people say, we need somebody who can get this group of people organized, Mary, where are you? Hey, we know when we need somebody to take lead on this and we never have to think about it again, Mary, where are you? You know, so you have to kind of be willing to own the, the parts that mm-hmm. are you, that maybe the military taught you, maybe they just inculcated it with you. Maybe they refined a few things. Maybe they got rid of some bad habits. Maybe they taught you some new bad habits. But leadership, when people talk about what to do now, I think it's never mattered more. And for my leaders right now, they're struggling. And they're struggling because the world has been in chaos and crisis and change, and they're not sure what to do next. 
So how do you address that? I mean, because there's all sorts of, of different ways to approach problems, and, and we've all looked at different ones, and there's a million guides, there's a million books that you can read on how to deal with change. And I mean, I'm thinking back to like the 80s, maybe it was the 90s, like who moved my cheese and all these these self-help sort of, you know, pop science. And the military follows these fads as well. You know, the black belt of, uh, you know, change management and all these different types of things. But there's some fundamentals, aren't there? There are some fundamentals. And, you know, I hate to say it, but it was an army general who told me this. Army general said, you know, you don't lead demographics. You lead individuals. Leadership is an individual thing. And you as a leader have to compel, coerce, entice, motivate individuals, which means you have to appeal to a broad variety of humans at a broad variety of levels. And that's critical to actually getting people to do what you want them to do, what you know they need to do, what you know is good for them to do, even when they don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's when it gets hard. And sometimes it may not make sense to them. And for you, it's crystal clear. And other times you were told to get it done and you don't think it's the best idea either, but you're going to do it because it's part of your job. Okay, we've all we've all been there. So right now, a lot of my leaders are struggling because they look at the world, they watch the news, and we're a world in chaos. But Tyler, we've always been a world in chaos. And if you taxonomize it, and I do, I like to put things in boxes. All of our brains love to go to our, even if our desks are unorganized, our brain is actually very organized. Even if we think it's not, it puts things in little boxes in our head. So I look at crises as there's geopolitical crises. Russia invades Ukraine. China is threatening Taiwan. Syria and Turkey just had an earthquake that killed 43,000 people. There's refugees. The oil prices are going up. There's food insecurity in Africa. North Korea is being naughty. Okay, all the standard geopolitical ones. And then we Being got naughty, I love that. Yes, they're always <laughs> naughty. They're always <laughs> naughty. They've been naughty for forever. I don't know a better way to put it. And then we have, say, economic issues. And those are, say, inflation at 6.4% right now. It's going to be that way throughout the rest of the year, regardless of what the Federal Reserve does. Now banks are failing. Housing prices are up. Rental properties are up. People are worried about whether or not they can pay their medical bills because medical costs are going up. Taxes are higher. Costs of labor are going up. If you own a business, you have to pay out more in benefits and wages. So there's economic costs that everybody is worried about, even if you don't know anything about economics. Mm -hmm. And then there are workplace issues. There's quiet quitting and the great resignation and are people loyal and do people feel a sense of collegiality and are people waking up with a sense of purpose and are they putting the interests of the organization where they should be as a priority? Are they getting work done or are they just going through the motions and collecting a paycheck? And then there's domestic issues, you know, crime and injustice and the fact that our education system is failing a lot of children and, you know, the lists go on. And then you can have personal crises. You know, maybe your kid got diagnosed with something or maybe your parents are getting older or maybe whatever. We've all got crises. Mm -hmm. The world is in a place of crises. And as leaders, what this means is when you come to work, your people at eight o'clock in the morning are already frazzled and tired and frustrated and a little annoyed. I have different words for that, by the way, but this <laughs> is a family show. So when we think about that, you have to remember that in any crisis, challenge, or change, and I mapped this out on a cocktail napkin for a buddy of mine, and I had named it because I was trying to make it easier for them to remember, and it kind of caught on, and now it's kind of copyrighted, and people make a very big deal of this, which is very flattering, but it kind of just makes sense. There's six stages. And the first stage of any crisis, challenge, or change. So let's say it's a leadership change at work and you're like, oh no, I hate that person. Or there's a new software system and you're a computer guy, so you're fine with it. But the rest of us are like, Tyler, you don't understand. We never learned the last software update or the one right. before it. We so just we're, we're got afraid. it done. <laughs> we're, we're afraid of like really not knowing this one. So this is a very big problem. Or let's say we all get smacked with you know a global pandemic. Our first reaction is, oh, no. Think, you know, your friend's kid gets into a fender bender. Oh, no. So the rejection stage is the first stage. And again, military. If I can't make an acronym out of it, I'm going to number it or make everything begin with the same letter of the alphabet. So these are all <laughs> our letters. So the first stage is the rejection stage. And then we very quickly move into the recognition stage. In the short term, we recognize what has to happen immediately. And we especially are super good at figuring out what has to happen in that moment. We're like, 
Your kid got into a fender bender. Do you need me to go pick up the other kids at school? Do you need me to go feed the dog? Do you need me to grab dinner? Do you need me to meet you at the hospital? Like, what do you need me to do right now to put a Band-Aid fix on whatever your most urgent crisis is right now? Mm -hmm. So in the case of COVID, it's I can I can save money on commuting. I can work in sweatpants or yoga pants or short pants or no pants, you know, whatever that looks like. And then in some cases, you know, you think, you start to you start to realize what's going to happen next and realization is the third stage well that's great i'll have more time with family that sounded so good in the beginning and then you had more time with family ha how does that sound now <laughs> the realization stage of any crisis challenge or change all of a sudden you realize all right this is going to go on for a while i'm going to have to make some changes again the habenula that part of our brain that deals with change it doesn't like change it doesn't like it at all so it pushes back, especially in the realization phase. And then you realize, I have to get better technology. I've got to move forward. I'm going to have to adapt to my new boss. Hey, this COVID thing is hanging around for a while. We've got to do more. And this is in the realization phase. This is where the leadership drive kicks in. Even if you're not in charge of anybody, you know you your family needs more of your time. Your friends need more of your presence. The people around you need more communication with more specificity, specificity and more often in this third stage. And then you get into the fourth stage, which is the resolution stage. And that's where we all band together and we say, we can do it. We can do this together. But all of these first four stages are very myopic. Mm -hmm. It's all about me, my job, my kids, my homeschooling, how this affects me, 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 my life. Real leaders, and most military people are, are pretty quick to sail through those first four stages. Go, got it, got it, got it. Where do you need help? What do I need to do? Got it, we're going to do this. And then they get to stage five, which is the new reality. And that's where you realize what the situation is going to look like into the future. In the case of COVID, getting people together is going to be more difficult. That this is going to hang around forever. We're going to have to deal with this till we all die of something. It may mm -hmm. not be COVID, but we're going to have to deal with it forever. Your boss really is going to be your boss. You're going to have to move to this new state. You're going to have to do whatever. But you really quickly get to that point of understanding the new reality and assessing that situation. That's the situational awareness piece. So you don't and have to love it. You just sort of have to acknowledge it, that this is real. It's It's happening. And then what? This is the pile you get. So once you get to that place, you're no longer being myopic. You are being very aware of how this is going to impact the people around you. And that pushes you into stage six, which is the realignment phase. And this becomes 100% external. First and foremost, how do I support my people? First and foremost, how does this affect our organizational strategy and actions? First and foremost, what do we need to be considering in order to be moving forward in the right direction? In the business world, it's how do we help our people? How do we adapt to change? How do we make sure our strategic plan is up to date? How do we be looking outwardly and supporting our clients, our customers, our people, our suppliers, our partners? Mm -hmm. Who do we reach out to? What actions do we need to be taking as a whole? What image do we want to portray? And the hard part is when you've got people who are still very much in the recognition stage of, wait, I, but I don't want to go back to work. I, I liked saving money on commuting and I want to stay home, even though I wasn't really doing anything. And you're way beyond that in stage six. And now you're looking at them and you're going, kids, we're, we're past that. Come on, come on, get on the train, get on the train where the train has left the station. And they're like, nah, -uh. and that's where we've got to disconnect. Because if you're really quick to that situational awareness piece, you have left behind a whole lot of people who are still stuck in stages one, two, three, and four. And that sounds, I mean, it sounds so easy when you say it, but then I'm thinking back to situations, even with the recent past of some more organizations are much more nimble than others. You know, we were doing a radio show where we we're talking to people in a small booth, you know, at the radio station. Clearly with COVID, that was a significant challenge. So mm -hmm. now we do things on Zoom and, you know, just sort of adapting to the reality. And it was, right. it's been great. Right. But at the same time, it was a significant change in processes and who we're dealing with and how we're doing it. And sort of the goals of, of coming home well changed because the opportunities were there. I guess they were always there, but it was just a, a forced change. That's it. It's a forced acceleration of change. And that's what was hard for a lot of people. Because again, our habenula pushes back. 
But it's a lot like if you've ever jumped out of an airplane, I know lots of your listeners have. First off, y'all, it's a real bad idea. Okay, whoever thought this was a good idea, it's a terrible idea. Wait, you're going to jump out of a plane with a piece of cloth attached to your body. Okay, all right. Superman does it, makes it look easy. I'm just saying it's a terrible idea. But the first time you do it, you're thinking about it, you're nervous, your hands, your stomach, you're sweating, you're miserable. You get in the mm -hmm. plane, you're still thinking this is not a good idea. And other people are under going, this is going to be fun. And you're like, this is not a good idea because you've got brains in your head. And you get up in the <laughs> plane and your heart rate is accelerating and your, you know, your, your, your pulse is high and your blood pressure's up and your hands are sweating. They're like, you ready to go? And you're like, no, not really. And then somebody helps you gently, not so gently out of the plane. The moment you leave the plane, your heart rate actually drops. Your, your pulse rate drops because there's nothing you can do about it. The decision has been made. Whenever people are stuck in a place of indecision or uncertainty, it creates turmoil. And for lots of people, the last three years have been just this state of uncertainty and turmoil where there's been no decision, there's been no ending, there's been no certainty. We as leaders have to be the certainty. And I tell people this and they say, well, I don't, I don't get how I be the certainty. I'm like, you have to be the certainty with people the same way you're the certainty with your dog. So if you've got a dog or a cat, I think it works with cats. I'm not sure. But Who knows? I don't I, know. I'm cats not, are not the same. No. I'm not sure what cats are thinking, except I own you and you should do what I say. I just don't That's know. That's right. But I know when a storm comes through or there's loud noises, my dogs and your dogs want to be with their people. They want to be on top of you, in you. If they could crawl into your skin, they would. Because you provide the certainty. And we as leaders have to be the certainty. We have to be the ones who pat head and hold paw and say, it's going to be okay because we know what to do. And we do know what to do. And that's what's, that's what I, I want to tell my veteran friends and their families that the military gave us a unique opportunity to be able to do what we did. Some people were on the pointy end of the spear, some on the not so pointy end of the spear, but we got to do what we did and learn things that other people don't get. Less than 1% of the population gets to do this. And I say get to because I do think it's a privilege and an honor. Mm -hmm. And I realize not everybody still feels that way, but I, I certainly do. And we know things that other people don't know. And we've been stress tested and we've been in crisis situations and we know what it looks like. And more importantly, if you've never been through something, you don't know how to bounce at the end of it. You don't know how to be resilient. And that's where I think a lot of people are struggling because nobody ever made them bounce before. They never had setbacks before. They never had to struggle before. You know, the, the, the struggle helps you overcome the things that happens later. Right. And if you've never had to struggle, you don't know you can do that. So we have a lot of people who never figured out how to bounce. And as a result, they're not very good at it. We have to help them bounce. And that doesn't mean coddle them. It means you be the certainty. You let them know it's going to be okay. They're going to get through it. And that, the, and that there's a path and you can help them with the path. You can't do it for them. You got to help them, but you got to, they have to walk that path. And if you have people like this who work for you or they're your peers, you may not realize it, but your peer to peer contact leadership is critical. People look to you wherever you are for leadership, simply because of your experience. And I don't know how how you all feel about it. But I always know when I go into a restaurant, you can spot the vets right away. I can spot the girls. I can spot the boys. I can spot everybody. It's not the haircut. It's just the presence. You mm -hmm. know who they are, you know? And I think we're lucky that way because we've got that, we've been able to have what a lot of people never got in the workplace. And that McKinsey came out with a big report last year. And they, they asked people, you know, why are people quiet quitting and all this other stuff? And I laughed because once I said, I was like, I could have saved y'all 60 pages of report. It's pretty easy. People want to wake up every day and feel like they've got a higher purpose. They want to feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves. They want to feel a sense of shared identity with other people. It does, that doesn't mean you're the same. It means there's some kind of shared something. Mm -hmm. A shared experience works great. They want interpersonal connections with people, even the introverts. They still need, we are still people who need people, people. That is us. We still yep. have to have that. And we still have to, when we show up to work, we have to feel as though we are of value. We have to feel a sense of, that we are important. And if we weren't there, somebody would miss us. And being respected and listened to and cared about is nice too, but that value is critical. And then we have to have what Chip and Dan Heath say in their book called Switch, 
peak moments. You know, the military sometimes makes big hooplas over retirements and promotions. And I'm not a big, I'm not a big ceremonies kind of person, but I understand the need for them because people need to hang on to a peak moment because it attaches a memory to an event. Otherwise, you're just slogging through every single day. You need a memory. You need mm -hmm. you need something out of the ordinary, even if it was pain in the neck. And a lot of us have been to the retirement ceremonies are kind of a pain in the neck. Or here's a plaque. Great. Another plaque. Well, but we need those peak moments so that the mem so that the day to day slogging gets broken up by an event so that our, our memory has a place to go back to. If you've been married, you remember your wedding day. You don't remember all your dates, but you remember your wedding day. If you've ever had a kid who's been born, you remember the day they were born because it's a peak moment in your life. And we are people who need that. And many organizations don't provide that. So we can always be the people who help people remember their purpose, provide peak moments, have that shared identity and be great at connecting things and people and make people feel valued. Like we've got that skill set. We have to use our powers for good. You know, it's really interesting. You talk about these, these topics that we talk about all the time, and they're so important. Finding your people and finding your purpose. And so when people get out of the military, that is often one of the biggest challenges they have is that transition, whether it was a, you know, a three-year tour or 20 years or 25 years. That transition can be really challenging. And some people are great at it and it's like nothing. It's they they were born for it. And other times, even if it was a short time, they joined out of high school and now they're 22, 23, 24 years old, they're having a really hard time because their worldview has been shaped by the military. And so they that's not a bad thing. That's often a great thing. But they don't know how to translate it. And mm -hmm. so finding your purpose. Like, what is your purpose in life? And you were mentioning it with the, the shared commonality of finding your people, finding your tribe, having that purpose, that shared environment, even though everybody's different, working towards something that is important. Now, with COVID, things have changed a lot. And so we've seen it where many of the meetings are by Zoom, you're isolated, people could go months, days, years without acting actually talking to someone in any substantive way outside of some digital communication or some uh, superficial communication like at a store. How do you think that's affected a lot of businesses and people transitioning and, and sort of that entire business environment? I spent 17 years in Asia before I retired. So I 17 years in Asia, my career, and then I'm back in the mainland for one tour, my one and only tour on the mainland of the United States. And then I got out. So people would give me very unhelpful advice like, you know, make contacts with your corporate friends. I didn't have any corporate friends. This was before Facebook and LinkedIn. We had MySpace, but nobody used it because it was creepy. And we weren't, because there were rules back then that said, if you had a clearance, you couldn't be on social media. You have to remember all that. So when I got oh, out, yeah. you know, there was those, there were all kinds of other transitionary And things. blogs and that was all banned. Yeah, oh, I remember that now. All of, remember that? So crazy. Actually, probably not so crazy. So I think a lot of people do struggle with that. And my, my niece, I had a niece who's a civilian, but she kind of struggled with it because she toddled off to college during COVID and only to be shut up in a dorm room. And so now she's a kid who's always been around her family for support, always been around her friends. She's not super social anyway, but now she's literally locked in a room. Now, some of us were used to that at that age, but we we were never alone for it. And that's the difference. And so she, she's like, I, this is not for me. This is not a good idea. And to help her, Tyler, I took my strategic planning process that I do with organizations and I flipped it on its head. Mm -hmm. And I said, I want to create for you your personal strategic plan. And I kind of wish I'd done this before I transitioned. And I mapped out and I started in, instead of starting out with your vision, mission goals, which is what most of us start with, I flipped all that on its head because I think a lot of us getting out you know, we, and we've all heard it. Well, what do you want to do? I don't know. I can do anything. And that's part of the problem. There's mm -hmm. nothing to narrow that focus. There's nothing to drive. It's like we're like cattle in, you know, in a field and the food is at the end of the field in a chute, but you got to get to the field and into the chute and out the other side to get the feed. That's kind of how I felt when I was like migrating around this. And here I am, this big field, not even, I don't even know where the chute is. <laughs> that's kind of how I felt. And I thought, well, what if I flipped my strategic plan on its head? So I started with, 
you know, what do your friends tell you you're good at? And then what do you think you're good at? And what do you know you're not so good at? And then of that, what are your core values? What do you, what's really important to you? You know, and not, not work-wise, just in your life things. And then mapping out that, again, trying to narrow that funnel, get you closer to the shoot. And then from there, figure out what your life purpose is. You know, Stephen Pressfield, who wrote The Legend of Bagger Vance, The Afghan Campaign, Last of the Amazons. He also wrote The Legend of Bagger, yeah, Legend of Bagger Vance too. And he also wrote The Art of War. No, The War of Art. Sun Tzu wrote the other one. <laughs> the War of Art, where he says, once you find what you're meant to be doing on the planet, you have to pursue it at the expense of all else. And, and I think the problem with a lot of us is it's hard for us to find our true purpose because we were doing other people's purposes for so long. And that's great. But in some cases, it masked what our what our own purpose was. So we have to kind of do some reflective things to try to figure out our purpose. And that means trying things and being okay with failing. It means saying, you know, I'll do this for three to five years. And if it doesn't work, I'll do something else. It means having the courage to not feel stuck. It means, you know, walking into a job and saying, hey, I want to do a great job for you. And this is what I need in return. It's being confident enough to be able to articulate what's going to work for you. And remember, it's all a big journey. You know, one of the things I loved about the military was the fact that I didn't have to pick one thing to do for 50 years. I got to move around every couple of years and do something completely different, which I liked a lot. Uh, was- and a lot of people love that about the military because no matter how bad it is, you know, and uh, counting down, it's going to be a year or two and it'll change. Mm-hmm. And so that that constant change, either by, you know, someone new commander or you PCSing, will solve most personnel problems. Mm -hmm. Now, as a civilian, we're starting to see that a lot more and and more and more outside in most career fields, people are not staying at one place for 20, 30 years. They're working for 18 months, a year, two years, and then moving to another job. Yep, statistically, you are 100% correct. The average baby boomer likes to ding on the average millennial and say, oh, those kids don't stay in jobs. Well, the average baby boomer only stays in a job now, statistically 4.6 years. So the average millennial, 2.6. So it's not that much of a difference, you know, once you get past age 21. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, I think a certain amount of change is healthy. And again, the number one reason people leave jobs is their first line supervisor. They're going to tell you something different when they leave. They're saying, "What do? You, why are you leaving? I'm leaving because you know to be closer to my family." No, they're not. They hate their family. I'm leaving to pursue, you know, a career in a different industry. No, they're not. They hate their boss. I'm leaving because I got this job opportunity. I just can't refuse because I hate my boss so much. I'll take anything that's better than this guy. Harvard <laughs> came out with this. It's true. Harvard. Uh, came it out is with- true. I I see yeah. it. Harvard came out with a study and it said 64% of employees said they would take a pay cut if it meant their boss would be fired. So of course I'm an economist. I'm like, how much of a pay cut? And is that a one-time deal or is that over time? Is that every month? Like you pay every month to not have that person. I've literally seen people in government positions take lower graded positions to get away from their bosses. Oh, I've seen it in the civilian world. that's, That's just amazing to me. But at the same time, it's not at all surprising. Correct. Correct. We have seen it. And so you have leaders that aren't great. There's a lot of people out in the civilian world. And this is something that is so different than the military, because at the baseline in the military, even if they're not a great leader, they've had lots of training. There's also guardrails. There's other commanders. There's other people that have been around. There's some guardrails. There's the inspector general. I mean, there's only so bad they can be before, you know, it gets like way beyond scope. But in the civilian world, there is no guardrails in, in many cases. You know, larger organizations may have these things, but medium and small size businesses are not. The HR doesn't work for the employee. It usually works for the business and getting rid of the employee is the easiest thing to do. And so you yeah. sometimes see that that in conflict with veterans who know something isn't right and, and are determined to make things work the way they should. Right. This is where sometimes I have to remind people very gently that just because you know it's not right doesn't mean you can fix it. Hello, Congress. So just because just because something's going on doesn't mean you have to be the one involved. That you have to ask yourself a couple questions. Do I own this issue? If you don't, maybe not. 
Will my involvement actively help others? Will I be happier if I get involved, for example, in an argument about politics on Facebook with somebody I don't know? Probably not. You know, <laughs> if I go up against my boss at work, is this going to make my life better or worse? You know, you have to ask yourself, is this going to make my life better? And if the answer is no, then focus on controlling the things you can control. What you can control, your health, your relationships, your family, your career, you know, the effort you put into your career. I had somebody complain lately and they said, you know, they, oh, you don't understand, you know, my organization doesn't train us. I said, well, what are you doing to train yourself? Well, they should be training me. No, it's your career. It's your life. If you want to increase your human capital, you take responsibility for your career. That's how it works. And all those other things that you can't control, you, you don't waste your time on those things. You have to focus on the things you can impact and the things you can change. And the rest of it, you have to let go. And sometimes that means walking away from a job. Sometimes that means walking away from a boss. And sometimes, and here's the problem is because we've fixed it in the past. We know how to do it. Mm -hmm. Somehow we can and we should. And sometimes we are slow to give up on organizations or people. And sometimes for our own health, for our family's well-being, we have to know when to walk away. And a lot of us are slow to do that. We do not give up. Yeah, you don't want to quit because, you know, we don't we don't have a bunch of quitters in the military. And so you're like, I can fix it. But then you're just creating more consternation, more problems, more conflict. Mm -hmm. What do you think is are some of the biggest differences between the military people that are, are leaders and non-military folks and, and sort of the, I guess, pluses and minuses or compare and contrast? There's a lot of similarities. I mean, leadership is leadership. Uh, of course, I subscribe to the empty cup theory of, of leadership. If you go to the West Point or OCS or anywhere and you go in with an empty cup of personality, by God, the services will fill it. However, if you go in with a mostly full cup of personality, there's that a little dash of the personality. And we all know those people that went in with empty cups, right? But you get out and all of a sudden you can't act the same way. And so you have to deal with civilians that are leaders and now you're, you have people with military experience and civilian leadership, leadership's leadership, but then there's different approaches, different methods, and different outlooks. And I think mm -hmm. that's something that I think is really interesting to explore. So I think a lot of military people get frustrated with straight, why I call straight civilians, like people have never had military contact, they've never worked in the defense industry, maybe, you know, all that. So th that's what I mean when I say straight civilians, just run of the mill, your standard mod one civilian. Okay. The, that the military people sometimes get frustrated because the directions aren't clear and they don't know how to succeed because the expectations aren't there. So how can I meet your expectations if I don't know what they are? Now, this also happens in the military, but it becomes more apparent in certain organizations. And we as former military people need to be okay with saying things like, hey, I need you to know I want to do a great job for you. And I want to make sure that I am I'm aligned with your goals. So, and one of the questions I, I tell people to ask their, their new bosses, especially, so I say, hey, do you want to share with me, you know, what's most important to you this month? And your boss is going to be like, what? And you're like, I want to make sure that my goals and my actions, my behaviors are aligned with what you need to have happen this month. So, you know, if you don't mind, just talk me through kind of what's going on in your head so that I can do that. And now all of a sudden, instead of being threatened by you, they realize that you want to support them. And sometimes they don't, they're going to be a little bit intimidated by you because simply because, well, I had a, I had a, a friend of mine who, again, just a mod one civilian. She said, oh, I'm just so afraid of the Marines. I said, why are you afraid of the Marines? They're the good guys. And she goes, well, cause they're, they're just big and loud and I'm just scared of them. And <laughs> It's so, so interesting to me because our perceptions are so different. You know, for me, I'm like, no, you don't understand. The Marines are the good guys. You know, they're the guys that you go, hey, Marines, we got this situation over here. And they're like, you know, they'll, they, they got your back. She didn't feel that way at all. So that was when I realized that some people are intimidated by military experience. And then some people are, again, they've got that image in their head that we're all, you know, just one little chemical tweak breakdown of a PTSD thing that's going to drive us <laughs> be homeless under a bridge. You know, that a lot of the Vietnam guys got that. My husband was a Vietnam vet and he certainly got that, you know, many you know, people would ask him, you know, so, you know, do you have these flashbacks? And he's like, it's not really something I'm going to talk about with you. Oh, so you do have the flashbacks. Like pe people are just some, they just don't know what to do with it. 
Right. So we have to understand that some people are going to be intimidated simply because of your background. And then in some cases, they don't know how to, they don't know how to use your skill sets. And so, you know, one of the things you can gently introduce them to your skill sets and just say, you know, hey, I'd, I'd love to learn more about this project if I could, you know, maybe shadow you for a little bit and learn from you. And then all of a sudden they realize, you know, you are trainable and you're coachable and all of those things. And that's one aspect where I think a lot of civilians don't understand is it is a whole lot harder to teach attitude than it is to teach a skill set. Oh, you know, yeah. I, I will take I will take stupid with a good attitude every day, you know, because that because if you're willing to learn, you know, it's great. You got a good attitude. That'd be great. But a lot of people don't realize that. And then sometimes they say, well, well, if you had some experience in this, you'd know what to do. Well, I want to make sure I'm doing it the way this organization likes it done. And so you have to sometimes say more words. So what my sister-in-law says about us is that we don't say all the words. Mm -hmm. And she, right. Especially around There's each other. There's some shorthand involved. It, it happens. Yep. And we tend to be a little bit more direct and a little bit more, yep, got it. So when I say I got it, it means you no longer have to worry about it. And I'll let you know if I run into trouble. But got it doesn't mean that way, that to everybody. So I have mm -hmm. to, when I got out, especially I had, I had a little sticker on my computer that says, use all your words today. Remember, use your <laughs> words. Because I would send emails back to people and then I'd look at them later and go, ooh, that did sound a little abrupt. Ooh, that did sound a little short. Ooh, maybe I should, I could temper that a little bit. You know, I had to learn to use An all email is so difficult because you can't tell tone in an email. I literally had this conversation with someone the other day where they, were, they brought an email to me. They were like a little concerned. And I'm like, look, you can't read tone in an email. And I always ascribe to the idea that they're great Americans just trying to get everything done. So if you can ascribe it without malice, how does that look? And then they're like, okay, I can see where it's just, you know, just a quick and to the point, get it done and, and not, but people get wound up on these things. People do get wound up. And again, here's why we've had years of, you know, before COVID hit and I'm so sick to death of COVID. I call it the disease that shall not be named. Before all this happened, we had a full work life. We had a full family life. We had things going on. We're taking care of our parents. We're taking care of our kids. We're taking care of the dogs. We're involved in the PTA. We're coaching literally. We're doing all the life things. And then you just slam a whole layer of stress on top of it. And now you got to homeschool. Now you got to work from home. And now you got to do all these other things. And now you're expected to do this. You can only get gas on Tuesdays and all these other things. And it added this element of stress, which acts the same on our physiology as a chronic injury and chronic pain. It, and if you've ever been around somebody with chronic pain, guess what? They're cranky. They're irritable. They're frustrated. They are short-tempered. They are angry. And lots of people are that way. So the fuses are much shorter. And that's what we have to understand. So what I gently advise people is if there's, I, and I laugh, I say, back when I deployed, we had letters, you had to put stamps on things, you had to write things. And it took months and months and months for things to get there. And sometimes letters would cross and you're like, wait, why did you gain 60 pounds? Because you missed the letter where somebody said they were pregnant. And all of a sudden, you know, you have to understand, you have to default to the good. If there are multiple ways of interpreting something, your job is to default to the best one possible. And that way you're not jumping to a conclusion that you have no business jumping to. And we all know people who, military people too, who will just jump to this random conclusion. You're like, hey, hang on. You can't go from apples and oranges, you know, over to the brisket section when we're still over in the fruit section. Like, come on, mm -hmm. let's stay focused on where we are. But some people jump to conclusions again, based on their perceptions, their experience and, you know, what they're accustomed to. So we have to default to the good. Sounds good. Now you've written a number of books. I think it was like 15 or something. So if you guys are interested in learning more and, and sort of seeing how Mary approaches all these leadership issues, it's not just the show today. There's a lot of, of various different books and, and talks and you can find all sorts of resources. Her website is ProductiveLeaders.com. It's pretty easy to, for even me to remember because I like, you know, I forget things like instantly if I don't write them down. But there's a whole bunch of books. It's an easy name to remember, Mary Kelly as well. So go check those out. We'll put links up on the on the social media stuff so you can go check them out. So you don't have to like write it down as you're listening. But Mary, we've talked about a lot of different topics, but I'm sure there are things that I haven't asked. What should I have asked you about but didn't? Well, what 
What I want to share is I have something special just for your folks today. So if they actually go to ProductiveLeaders.com forward slash podcast, they're going to get my 12 months business success and accountability planner. And it's about 50 pages. You can download it on your computer. It, it's not going to do anything weird. And you can fill it in and it helps you organize your life. And the things I'm talking about with your boss, you know, hey, what are your goals for the month? And what do you want to do less of this month, boss? And how can I support you with this? It's good for working with your boss, but it's also really good for you to get your life aligned because it asks you things, you know, at work, what do you want to do more of? What do you want to do less of? What can you outsource? What can you streamline? What can you resolve? Who can you call for advice? You know, it walks you through every month what's most important to you. And for a lot of us, we're so busy doing, we don't always do the planning that makes us more successful. So this is a really good career advancement tool that a lot of my senior executives from Fortune 500 companies use. It's wildly popular. The other thing I have for you all, it's called the Leader's Blind Spot Assessment. It's pretty fun. In 90 seconds, it will tell you what your superpowers are and also some areas where some people may not perceive those superpowers to be quite so super. And I love it because <laughs> I, I created it for my physicians who, my physicians and my CEOs, both of whom have the attention spans of a toddler on a peach monster drink. I'm telling you. So the idea was to give them something they could use as a mirror. And for that mirror, it's, you know, what you need to be doing, what you need to be thinking about, and this will be really helpful. And then there's a bunch of my, I have a series of five minute plans. You know, the military taught us to, if you're going to use it more than once, create a checklist out of it, help the person coming after you. So I have about 80 of them. My most popular ones are at this special site just for your listeners today. So that's I awesome. Find some of it helpful. And that's the whole idea. It's a super secret vault. So it's forward slash podcast. So and we'll put the link on there and, and make sure you guys can find it super easy. But let's talk about that blind spot piece for just a moment, because I think I know what you mean. But like, you know, like in a car, it's where your mirror is not covering. You have to look over your shoulder. W what do you mean by that? So we've mapped out based on how. You, so a lot, you know, I do disc assessments and the anagrams and all the other things. But I needed something that was fast, accurate and easy. So this has eight main personality drivers. So there's the four primes and then there's the combinations. So that's, and then it's an acronym, it's CAMP. Are you a competitor, an analyzer, a motivator, or a peacemaker or a combination thereof? And so let's say you are a competitor. A competitor in the anagram world is sometimes referred to as an achiever. In DISC, they can be a high D, but this is what drives you. This is what motivates you to do the things that other people maybe don't want to do. A lot of entrepreneurs are competitors. For example, the problem with that is sometimes as a competitor, you will take the win at any cost. And sometimes that allows you to cut corners or not pay attention to details. If you are an analyzer, sometimes you are so caught up in the minutia and the numbers and those are the things that make you great at your job, but sometimes you can't see the unintended consequences of the decision because it's a very personal response and it's not measured in numbers, for example. Mm -hmm. If you're a motivator, people like to be around you. You bring the party. You're awesome. And you go, yeah, I am awesome. People like me. Everybody likes you. You are great in sales. You are great in social situations. You are great at networking. You are great at parties. If people have a party, they want you there. The problem is sometimes you're not so good at the details. Maybe you're not so good at providing all the facts. Maybe you don't <laughs> like to finish projects. Not as so good at providing the facts. Yeah, I, I as soon as you said that, I have like people in mind that you know, like very good surface level, great at negotiating, great at this, you know, all these social situations. But then they're talking, you're like, that's not right, mm -hmm. or you know, and people, the technical people. Uh, like mm -hmm. conferences in the technical fields, they'll often have an engineer standing by because as soon as you start asking technical questions, they're like out of their depth and they'll bring the engineer over to answer your questions. I, I'm just picturing this. So it, it sounds very accurate. There you go. And then the, the P for this one is the peacemaker. And these are the people who sometimes will subjugate their own their own needs and wants and careers for other people. Now, it also makes them very good at things like negotiating. They're good at seeing the win-win. They're great at balancing things out. They're those people who are great at meetings going, you know, hey, Tyler, we didn't hear from you today. You want to jump in on this or whatever. They're very considerate of other people. But again, sometimes there's, there's some pitfalls and we all have them. 
sometimes we don't like to hear them, but we all have them. And so sometimes it's, it can be a great tool to work, to use it at work too. Mm. I've got several organizations who are using it and they, and the idea is how do you just understand the people around you a little bit better? How do you understand yourself? Because sometimes the job that we're in forced us to be somebody we aren't naturally. And then, and sometimes once we figure out who we are naturally, once, once we compare that with our, our real, you know, align us, align ourselves with our goals and our personalities, all of a sudden that can put us into a much better working environment. You know, just because you are a hard charging fill in the blank in the military and you did this and this and this, maybe, maybe you did it because that was the job. It's not who you really want to be, or it's not who you really are. And if you were in a job that was more aligned to that, you'd be happier. It doesn't mean you have to still do that forever. No, that's a great point. In fact, that's often what I uh, we hear about people that are transitioning. Like, yeah, that's what you did, not who you were. And, and separating that identity from the job is sometimes challenging. It's more challenging for some people than others. But I was definitely thinking about all the things you were talking about and how I've organized my schedule and, and time so that I focus in on things, but also have the flexibility to surge or go after things I think that are super interesting. And so I'm not like overwhelmed with the, you know, hundred percent. Now I'm adding an extra 5%, you know, right. if I'm like 85 and then I've got 10% that I can flex to things that's most comfortable to me. But, you know, some people need to be, you know, every moment of every day booked with meetings and down on the calendar and, you know, I, everything's blocked out. And so it, it's definitely a personality, but also organizationally driven thing. And definitely interesting to think about. Folks, we'll put up the link to the podcast link that Mary has created just for you guys to listen to and go participate in. It's productiveleaders.com, but we'll put up the link. You don't have to worry about it. We'll, we'll get it to you. Mary, thank you so much for joining us on Coming Home Well. Is there anything else that you want to talk about while you're, while you're here? I think we all need to take better care of each other. You know, what, what a lot of people did in COVID is they put on their masks and they stopped looking at each other. And we need, now that the masks are off, it's time to look at each other again. And we got to take care of each other. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much for joining us on Coming Home Well. Thanks so much for having me. It was wonderful having time with you. Best of luck to you and all your listeners. Thanks again. Thanks for joining us this week on Coming Home Well with Dr. Tyler Pieron. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and a review. Thanks again. And until all are home and all are well, this is Coming Home Well.